Hello and welcome to this week's IGTV. I'm talking about sending your teenager to university or college. Is anybody else a crying mess or is it just me? And what all about all the expectations? How do you set them up to fail? What if you set them up to succeed? How, what if you, how do you do both? Oh my goodness, so many questions. I so get it. Cause I'm in gonna be in this boat in September. All right, so here is what I've done. I have interviewed some teenagers who have gone through this experience in my life so that I can share this with you today. My name is Allie Payne. I'm a certified life coach, certified relationship systems coach, and I have been working with parents and teens to help them end the painful disconnection, emotional blowups, and stressful silences so that you can build relationships on trust and respect without having to be at your wit's end, giving up or giving in. Okay, let's jump in, shall we? All right. Um, so as I said, I interviewed a couple of the teenagers in my life who have been through this and I want to share this with you. Now, I want to be clear. Um, there's two sections to what I'm going to talk about today. One of them is going to university or college. One of them is going away to residence, like because you, you might live in the same city as your university or college. So your student, your teenager may live at home during this time, or your teenager might have to pack up and move. So these are... There's two different topics here that you're going to hear about today. One is setting them up for success at university or college, and the other is um, setting them up for success when they're moving away for the first time or living away from home, okay? So let's jump in. Here's the first point. University or college, either one, is not like high school. It is not like high school. The professors will not treat you like a child. The professors are going to treat your teenager like a competent, intelligent adult. There is no babysitting. They will not be babysat, okay? So this is really key in how you are raising your teenager to be a competent and reliable adult because in university or college, they're not going to be babysat by their professor. It's not happening. If you don't hand in assignments, nobody's chasing you. Nobody. Which is why I don't recommend all the monitoring and controlling during the high school years. And because unless you're moving away to college or university with them, I don't think it sets them up to succeed. Okay. So um, there's no babysitting at all. I've got a lot of notes here. So I'm just going to keep my book here. This is not high school. It is not high school. Your prof sometimes will prefer to be called by first name. They're gonna call you by their first name. Um, they, they expect your teenager to show up and put up, you know, or, and, and they're not, they are not losing sleep if your teenager decides not to. It's not their job. Their job is not to babysit. So I can't be clear enough about that. That was one of the biggest points that I got. All right, you, your teenager, <laughs> I keep saying you as if you are your teenager. I hope you watch this with your teenager. I hope you let your teenager watch this. I hope it's helpful. Uh, and there's some nuggets for you and your teenager in this. Um, when you go away to college or university, instead of being one of say 30 students in a classroom, um, your teenager is more likely to be one of hundreds in a lecture hall, hundreds in a lecture hall. And that can be very, very unnerving. Uh, very scary, anxiety provoking to walk into a lecture hall of say 400 people and all of a sudden you are not the only person there and um, the professor, you don't have a name to the professor. They're not doing roll call. Uh-uh. They're there to teach what they teach, whether you showed up or not. So that can be very unnerving when you are... Um, just one, uh, like a small fish in a big pond. Um, and, you know, finding your seat the first day. I've heard that that is really unnerving as well. Can you guys just give me a yes below if you can hear me? I'm having a moment of my own anxiety that my, my wireless headphone microphones are not working. I'm sorry, I'm just having a moment of a freak out. Can you just hit a yes in the comment if you can actually hear what I'm saying? Please, thank you. Um, Okay, thank you so much. I don't know why all of a sudden my anxiety decided to tell me that that was something I should check. There you go. I'm talking about anxiety. I'm getting anxious, you guys. <laughs> okay, so 
this is something that I heard is that when you walk in, when your teenager walks into lecture hall the first day, if they're in a lecture hall, some colleges, the benefit is much smaller classes. So I'm, I'm trying to cover the whole gamut here. If your teen is walking into a large lecture hall, get them to, if they can, go and look at that lecture hall in advance. Like even just look in the window, they probably won't be allowed in uh, prior to class. The, the doors are often locked. Get them to have a look in the window. How big is this lecture hall? Um, you know, where do they think they'd be comfortable sitting? Do they, are they like a front row center kind of person? Are they a middle middle person? Are they a to the left in the middle person? Like just get them to decide in advance where they think they're comfortable sitting. So when they walk in that lecture hall for the first time, go to that area and pick a seat and sit there. Um, I have also heard from some students that you want to stay where you sit after the first couple days because the people around you in that lecture hall will become your friends, your pals. If you missed something, you'll be like, what did he say or what did she say? Those people become their, your friends. And so you're moving around the lecture hall actually doesn't serve you only because the people that you sit with become kind of your pals in that program, even if it's just to ask questions about the course itself, not about like you hang out after extracurricular activities. So kind of pick your spot, stick to your spot, get to know the people around you. Those are your peeps in that class um, who, you know, are you gonna ask questions to. All right. Um, okay, so before, let's talk a little bit bo about before leaving. I'm sorry I'm jumping around a little bit. I've got like to all pages of notes from interviews. So I'm I just wanna get this across to you. If there is a way for your teenager when they get their, um, their timetable to go onto the campus and see where the classes are, that is ideal. So whether they're moving away or they live with you and they're going to college or university, get them to walk out what those time changes in between the classes are gonna look like. Because on some very large campuses, getting between one class to the next in the time given is really difficult really difficult. Like they might need to have two subjects worth of books in their backpack because there's no time to go back to the car or back to their residence to change books. They might need a scooter or like a skateboard or something or a bike just for that one class change that can be really um, challenging between buildings. Okay. So get them to time that out. How long does it take them to walk between buildings or between classes? Is that reasonable for that particular part of their timetable? How else can they prepare in advance for these classes that might take longer to get between? Do they need to pack snacks that day? Because now there might be a four or five hour, four hour period where they don't have time to grab some food. Um, these are things to do in advance of starting classes. You don't have to go in the class. Like I said, the doors might be locked. You look in the window, but just walk it out. Figure out where everything is in advance. It will lower anxiety and stress so much to know where your classes are, know where your programs are. Some universities have um, have freshman days or have um, like orientation days where they open up the buildings and your, your student can go and do all of that. Do it to the best of their ability, okay? So that they've got that going. Um, all right, here's another thing as, as school is approaching. Um, I will talk about when you're moving away from home to do this as this part two of this. Right now I'm gonna talk about just the going to university or college. Um, go to office hours, your prof office hours, like go to office hours. So this is what I've heard, this is what I got information from the teenagers in my life. If you're in a larger college or university, you are now one of say three, 400 students and your prof is not there to learn your first and middle name and what you like for lunch. That's not their job. They're going to treat you like an adult. So if you go to office hours at the beginning of class or beginning of the program, okay, and you connect with your prof because not that many people will go to office hours or will go to hear about the syllabus presentation, which is 
What is included in this class? What's the expectations? How is it going to roll out? Go to those classes. Go to office hours and meet your prof. Connect with them there. Because... If you have a problem in the class later on, you've made that connection with the prof. So if you need to ask for, look, I didn't understand that, or I have a, I have a question about this, they are gonna be more likely to take your email or your, your Zoom call because you made the time to show up to their office hours, ask questions, it shows participation, it shows commitment. So go to office hours, connect with your prof in the beginning, so if you need help later on, then you've made that connection. Now, if you're in a college and your classes are smaller, maybe you only have 20, 30 people in your class, you might not need to go to office hours because you just naturally have a smaller group of people and you can more easily connect with your professor. So um, use that up for your judgment. But that was strongly, strongly recommended as a way to build a relationship before the term starts also, if you have any um, diagnosed mental health issues, if you have some family concerns, if your your grandmother is um, passing, um, and you know it's an unknown date, uh, you know let your prof know that in office hours that this is going on for you and your family, and it might show up during the semester. Uh, if you have mental health concerns and you have uh, a specific exceptions for anything, you got go to office hours and in person let them know. Yes, they're going to get a piece of paper from the university about you, but you know what? They're not your parent, so they're not going to sit and read through it and email you and be like, "Ooh, I just got your little piece of paper. Are you okay?" Profs don't do that. They don't do that. It's up to you to go and show up to and introduce yourself and make sure they understand if there's any ongoing issues or or uh, outstanding things that are might come up for you during the semester. OK, um, the other thing is go to syllabus day. If there is a syllabus day where your prof um, is going to talk about what the what's going to be covered in the program and the way that it's going to go down, go to that. Here's why. You might, your teenager, I know I keep saying you as if I'm talking to your teenager, just I hope you understand what I mean if I'm being clear. Um, you, you might have signed up for a course that you saw the outline for and was like, yeah, that sounds really interesting. I want to go to that course and it's going to help me, you know, toward my, my degree or my pursue my passion, whatever that is. Then you go to syllabus day and you hear the prof explain what is in this program, okay? And you're like, oh, no, that, that wasn't what I thought this was at all. But better yet, you will also find out these key points of information. What are the percentages assigned to each assignment, exam, quiz, or final? Some courses have only two assignments and they're 50% and 50%, and that's it. So you need to know that information because that is going to be how you prioritize this course with the rest of your courses in your life. If the program is mostly written assignments and it's going to have a ton of reading assigned and you are not a reader, then you might want to find a different way to get that course or get that program. If you are not a stand up and talk in front of other people kind of person, and this you find out in the syllabus uh, day that this program requires you to not only do like 50% of your mark is, pub is presentations, but it's group projects, and only 25% is the written exam, you might be like, mm -mm, nope, that's not gonna be for me. So these are, this is why these syllabus um, days and finding out about the actual program and what's offered is so important. Also, you find out what is the prof's primary delivery style. Mm? Might not be yours. The prof may be a talker and has literally no notes, no slides, no notes, no nothing, and you are a visual, like written person and you're listening to them talk the whole time, it can be very overwhelming to try and take notes for all of that. You might wanna find a different prof who offers a similar course. If the prof uses all pictures, all pictures but no written words, 
you, you might not connect with that learning style. If the prof is all slides, all heavy reading slides, almost basically no talking, and you're an auditory learner, that's not gonna work. You might wanna find a different prof who offers a similar or the same course. This is why going to syllabus day is so important. Okay, I hope this is making sense and it will be helpful when you rewatch this with your team. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Okay. Um, so another one is don't compare yourself to other students. Okay. This is like small fish, big pond. All of a sudden you walk into a lecture hall and you've got someone there who's like, seems to have it all together and they're studying all the time in the library when you see them and they're doing all the work. Yeah. You know what? You don't know what's going on in the rest of their life. And maybe that's the way they study. And yet you don't study in that same way. You get a better mark on the exam than they did. And that's just their way. So just Meh, meh. Don't compare yourself to everybody else, okay? Meh, forget that noise. I cannot say this enough because this was one of the number one things that the teenagers told me is that you will be treated like an adult, not like a child. You are responsible for meeting basically the agreement of the syllabus. Like here's the course you signed up for and paid for. Here's the syllabus. It's considered basically like an agreement. This is how it's gonna roll. Either you roll with it or you don't. There's no begging and pleading for it to be different for you. Okay. Um, ask questions in syllabus day if you're uncertain about how certain assignments are gonna be graded or how group projects might look. Ask questions because if you need to withdraw from the course, you can withdraw then or change right then if you went to syllabus day and it wasn't for you, wasn't what you thought it was, that is the time to change or withdraw, not halfway through because you said you didn't know. So go ask questions, ask questions. There's no stupid question. There's only the question that didn't get asked, okay? Um, so say, okay, um, syllabuses. I did not know this. Save the syllabus. Never get rid of the syllabus itself. Okay, digital copy, paper copy. I know I'm making it look like it's a piece of paper. Maybe it's a digital copy. Save all your syllabuses because if you do, for instance, say two years at a, at a local college and then you transfer to a university, guess what you have to produce? The syllabuses to the syllabi, syllabuses, syllabi, I don't know, what's plural? Um, to You're going to have to produce those so the university you're transferring into can confirm you have gotten the learning required for the credits to transfer. So I don't care if it's year three, year four, keep the syllabuses so you have proof of it, what in fact you have done and learned. Okay, um, there is no shame in withdrawing. Okay, I know I just posted a TikTok on quitting and I've done uh, an IGTV on your team can't quit. There's no shame in withdrawing from a course because it's either you went to syllabus day or, and you found out that clearly the workload in that course is not going to be manageable based on the other courses that you also have going on. Maybe your teen is going away to college or university to play sports. Sports on top of every, and, and not all sports are year round. A lot of sports are only part of the year. Maybe in that part of the year, they don't take the really heavy, heavy course based on the syllabus information because it's going to tank them. Like why, why would you set that up for, for failure? Why would you do that? That's pointless. Um, I'm not saying that going to college or university is setting your teenager up so they can party all day long and spend your well-earned money, but I'm saying let's be reasonable. Like, don't you want them to feel really confident about what they're, about what's reasonable capabilities and do well at the courses you've already paid for? Hmm? So there's no shame in withdrawing. If you go to syllabus day, it's not what you thought it was. The workload is not appropriate for that semester or that term. It's not what you wanted. Get over it. Get out. This is your money parents. So let's just not throw it and spend it because that looks good and sounds good. Let's support our teenagers to take the education in a way that's workable for them so they do great and build confidence and esteem while they are going through their education, even if their education might take an extra year. Instead of taking five full course load, maybe take four. You decide. Let your teenager decide, but have the conversation, okay? And if they call you um, because they want to withdraw from something, just take a breath and listen. I know I've made so many videos about listening. 
but this is the time to dig in and just listen, okay? Um, universities are hard. It's not high school. University and college is can be harder, especially full-time. So mental health is a big issue. It is a real concern, and you've got to pay attention to it. Okay. Um, there are some courses your teen cannot withdraw from. There are going to be programs that they have to take from that prof in that way, in that term or semester, and they can't withdraw, and it's going to suck. Make peace with it. That is a quote directly from one of the teens I interviewed. <laughs> it's going to suck. Make peace with it. <laughs> do the best you can, given the situation, do the very best you can, get through it and get over it, and let's be done, okay? So that was that's the biggest piece of advice I can give you on that one. All right, on to the next thing. When you are looking at your syllabus, note what percentages, as I said, are tests, exams, presentations, and is that workable? I've already stated that. It needs to be workable for your teenager's learning style, your teenager's um, exam kind of prep style. Um, and if it's not changeable or because like, you can't just pick and choose all of them, but you got to be, you have to know this, you have to know this in advance, you know, going into like next week and being like, Oh, that assignment's due Wednesday. Oh, that's 50% of my grade. No, 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 no. That doesn't work. You got to know this stuff up front. All right. Um, uh, I talked about your prof's presentation style. You, this is why if you're in a lecture hall, it's really important that you get to know the people around you because if you are more auditory and you want to record and then get a transcription or um, you're not awesome at note taking, you could make a deal with one of the people around you that maybe they share some notes with you in exchange for something else. I don't know, but you want to make sure you got your course peeps, okay? Make a calendar. Time management is so critical in college and university because again, you're going to be treated like an adult. So you may not have a visual teenager. That's fine. Maybe they put it in their phone um, and they put everything, you know, a couple weeks in advance that you need to be working on this. You need to have like take the big picture of the calendar of when are your certain assignments or labs or big things due. map it out and then break them down into small chunks. When, when can I, should I be 50% done this? And what does that even mean? Like, should I have the outline done and should I already be finished some of my hypothesis or whatever that looks? Help them to prioritize and chunk things down into smaller bits. Now, when I say prioritize, this is something my husband tells our kids all the time. There are going to be times in university when you feel like you have a fire hose in your mouth. And there's very little you can do about that. This is not, this is real, this is getting more real world here, okay? There's a fire hose in your mouth. You've got to prioritize. And sometimes that means doing good enough in one area so that you can prioritize something that has a higher percentage grade value on something else. And um, because I don't know if you're listening, parents, but if you're new here, Perfect is not workable. Do not aim for perfect. And this can be extremely challenging if you had a teenager who excelled in high school in that format of learning, I did, and then goes to university where it's more loosey-goosey because you're expected to do all that yourself and then is almost failing out. I did that too. Um, because I went from straight A's in high school to like C's in university because it wasn't the same kind of daily structure um, and I don't do well without external structure, some version of external structure. So I really flailed. I also didn't love what I was learning. It wasn't my passion. My parents chose my career and what I was going to go study. So that didn't help. But, um, time management is a massive deal if you only have two assignments in the term and they're both worth 50%, right? So you got to map out the big picture so that you can make it more granular and manageable on a day-to-day -day basis, knowing where should you be, or week-to-week -week basis maybe, where should you be in each course, so that when you get to, you know, it's due next Wednesday, you're not like, oh my gosh, like you're like, yeah, yeah, well, I'm three quarters done, uh, you know, I'm gonna have a, a full weekend, but I'll be okay, right? Something like that. 
Um, the workload is very, very different. Um, it could be all reading, depending on the subjects uh, or area of focus that your teenager is going through. It could be a lot of labs. It could be, it's very different than high school. So having that conversation with your teen or just watching this video with them would be very helpful. Um, you need to learn to take breaks. So again, high school is not quite as overwhelming, although it depends on your teenager, so I don't wanna make blanket statements about that. University in those times where you feel like you've got the fire hose in your mouth and you're, you are trying to teach your teenager in those moments, the fire hose moments, to prioritize. If this is only worth 25% of this grade, then you get through and you do the best you can. If this at the same time is worth 50% of the grade, then you put more attention on the 50% piece, you know, and you've got another thing going on that you can delay a week or something. You have to help your teenager understand how to prioritize their workload, even in the times where it feels like they're drowning. Okay. Speaking of drowning, take breaks. It's be, it's unrealistic to think that they're going to go to university. They're going to get stressed. They feel super responsible because of the money that you have paid for them to be there and they take that on their shoulders and they don't want to disappoint you and then they feel guilty because they know how important this is to you. Do you see where I'm going with this? Um, that you help them understand they have to take breaks. So well, this is another thing my husband tells our boys all the time. He would always take Friday night until Saturday at noon off. No homework. From Friday at 5 to Saturday at noon was no homework. That means if he went out and partied, he was doing it Friday night. If he was hungover and needed to sleep in, it was gonna be Saturday morning. But that was absolute no homework, no schoolwork time. Um, so what is that, 12, uh, 17 hours every week where there was gonna be no homework. And that helped him to balance mental health balance um, social life, balance fun activities, recreation times with getting through his degree. So there has to be a, one night a week or a day where there's no homework or something in order to um, be sustainable. And a, a lot of focus studies show that taking a 10 minute break every hour or taking a 20 minute break every two hours is also very good for sustainability. And in that two hour, in that time frame, that 10 minutes or 20 minutes, you need, to, you must, it does not mean sitting on your phone. That's not a break. It means get up. You've got to get, physically get up and move your body. Go for a walk, go for a quick jog, um, go get some water, remind yourself to stay hydrated, uh, and then get back to it. But mini breaks are also really important for sustainability because burnout is a very real thing in university. And if we're not equipping our teenagers to understand what that means now, then we're not helping them, okay? Um, all right, let's talk about... Um, Let's talk about moving away to, to uh, well, okay. No, I'm gonna go back. So if your teenager's living at home and they're going to a university or college, one of the things that I was told from a teenager is to, to encourage them to get involved. It's easy not to get involved when you live at home and are going to a smaller college or university. You just go there to class, you know? You go there for class and you leave. But here's what ends up happening. After graduation from high school, your teenager's core group of friends have probably all dissipated. Like they're all going in different directions to different schools, different locations, pursuing different passions. So your teenager's social connection, which is critical, their social network has kind of shrunk a little bit, okay? Some teenagers, all of their friends leave and go in different directions and now they're feeling kind of alone and maybe they were in sports or something else really common in, in high school and that ends when you graduate and now it's like they're like alone on an island. For mental health reasons, that is not that constructive. So helping your teenager, encouraging them to get involved, even if they live at home, get involved in the college or university, Go to some, um, some of the sport games, go to some club nights, go to some of the social events, 
try and still meet people, make a friend or two, uh, even in smaller classes, 20, 30 people, make some friends and find a way to connect there. Because otherwise, from a mental health perspective, when they're still overwhelmed with course load and they still got exams, they still have all those things, even though they live at home, it's harder to have an outlet that that take a break that outlet time if they haven't been supported to find a new friend group or meet a few people or get connected to the college in a way through their passion or a sport or a hobby or something it's important for mental balance so get connected it's also really easy if they're not connected i hear to just go oh, well like it's just college like whatever it's just college um that's hard-earned money that we paid for. Could we not do that? <laughs> so help them to get involved or connected in some way. Okay, um, now I'm going to move to when your child is moving out. I'm gonna be in this boat in September. I will be here regularly crying my eyes out. Um, when your teenager is moving out, make time for family things, if that feels appropriate in your family with your teenager, to spend some time together, spend some quality time together, come up with some interesting activities, most memorable moments, um, you know, games, camping, a, a, you know, a staycation, whatever it looks like, to have a memory to lock into with your teen before they left. And I know like for our teen, it's also about getting together with friends. All these high school friends that I said, they're all going different directions. Get to support your teenager to create, um, maybe even just one friend, one or two friends. So create your, support your teenager to create that social connection before they leave. So they have a memory to hang on to. They have something when they're feeling like that small fish in the big pond and feeling a little bit lost, okay? So spend the family time together before they leave. Support them to have some friend time before they leave. Here is something else I would say. If your teenager needs to learn basic life skills, you need to start now. How to do laundry. And I don't just mean show them how to do laundry. Like you don't know what the washing, sorry, uh, a phone call just came in there. Um, you don't know what your teenagers are like or, or what they're, what the, sorry, I got distracted with the phone call. You don't know what the washing machines are like at their university. If they're coin op, has your, has your teenager ever used a coin op uh, washing machine? Do they know how to put the coins in and like go to, go do laundry at a laundromat to show them what it's going to look like at university. Their, their washing and washer and dryer aren't probably going to look like what yours look like. Do they know where to put the detergent? I know this sounds crazy, but these are things that teens don't know. And they tell me because they're ashamed to admit it. They're ashamed. And if you think that they're ashamed now that they don't know, wait till they get to the university and realize they don't know how to run that washing machine. So show them a couple different washing machines. Where does the detergent go? Um, how do you use a coin op? How long is it going to run for? Don't leave your wet laundry in the laundry machine because the next person who comes along is gonna be really frustrated. That happened at my university. If you're done your washing, set the timer on your phone so you go down and get your wet laundry out of the washing machine. Don't leave it there all day to smell and get manky or have people like me get really pissed off because now I can't use the washing machine because your stuff is in there because eventually I'm gonna just take it out and put it on top, even all of your private bits, okay? So you gotta teach them how to use a laundry machine. Um, do they know how to do basic vacuuming? Do they know how to do basic cleaning? What's, I don't know what's required at their university if they're moving away. Are they living in an apartment or are they living in residence? These are all things that your teenager needs to be equipped with to understand. So that brings me to um, another thing. Uh, I know I kind of said this, sorry, I'm skipping. No, I'm gonna go back, uh, I'm gonna go back to this, okay. so. Shared spaces. If your teenager is going to share a space and have a roommate, whether it's in residence or off campus in an apartment, have they ever had a roommate before? Probably not. 
I actually have access to a roommate agreement document from a large Canadian university. If you would like me to send it to you, I'm happy to do so. That university actually requires roommates to not only do the agreement, sign it and fill it out, it is contingent to them getting their damage deposit back. That's how cool this is. Our teenagers, if they've never been set up to have a conversation to negotiate what being a roommate looks like, you need to start that now. Start that conversation now. Message me, uh, just say roommate agreement in the comments and I'll get you the link, okay? Um, They need to understand about shared spaces. Noise. Maybe they're an introvert. I just did two videos on raising an introvert, raising an extrovert. If they're an introvert and their roommate is an extrovert, you're gonna have, that's gonna be a conversation about what does noise look like? Um, What does studying look like? Um, If they study in their room, is there, if there's a desk in their room, are they a loud music study person or are they a quiet person? Do they need noise canceling headphones um, to be successful? What is the lights out quiet time? Most residences, it's 11 o'clock. What is the agreement about having um, cleaning and tidying if, if there isn't already a cleaning service? Like how often are they gonna clean their rooms? How often are they gonna clean the bathroom? And what does that even look like? These are agreements they need to walk through. Trust me, please do this now with your teenager. Also, who is allowed in their room? Who else is allowed in their private space if it is a shared room? Are boyfriends and girlfriends allowed? Are friends allowed? Because if you left your knickers like out on your bed by accident and then a boyfriend comes in and then there's like, this is private space. So helping your teenager understand what the kind of agreements they're gonna need to do if they have a shared room or a roommate, don't assume these things because I will tell you what assuming does and it's worse than the little acronym, okay? It's gonna blow up and create one of the worst university experiences for your teenager that they've ever had. So this is critical that they talk about cleaning, tidying, um, who's coming in their room. Um, Use the library to study. Use the library. So libraries often have spaces that are are collaborative talking spaces where food or drink is allowed. And then libraries will often have silent spaces where there's no food, no drink, no talking allowed. It's totally quiet. Encourage your teenager to find a space on campus, whether they live at home or not, to go and do their homework. Because they may find that when they're at home, they're not really motivated to do their homework. But if they stay on campus a couple extra hours, they get more homework done. Encourage them to walk the campus. It might not be in the library. It might be a corner desk under a stairs somewhere. And that's just their, their space, their jam. Great! But encourage them to go and find that place. Um, find their people. Not only the people who sit around them in the lecture halls, but also um, people who maybe come to the library at the same time as they do. Totally different topics, that's not the point. Find their tribe, even if this is whether they live away or they live at home. Find and connect to just a few people because if they are feeling challenged, it might not be in a specific topic or that course, but if they're feeling challenged, now your teenager has some people to reach out to. Remember, small fish, big pond, okay? So helping your teenager to find their people, and they might have library people, and then they might have um, certain course lecture hall people, and then they might have like intramural hobby people, it doesn't matter, but there are their people that they have to reach out to, to say, I'm struggling, I need help, I need to commit to you to show up to the library at five today because I haven't been going and I'm I'm struggling or something, okay? This is really, really important. Uh, This was one that I, the quote that I got from a teen that I've loved. It was, find your crying corner. Find your crying corner. If your teenager is having a rough time, whether they live at home or they've moved away, having a safe place, maybe their car, Um, maybe they don't have a car there, but having a crying corner is important. A place where they feel like they can go and let it out and not be embarrassed or shamed or feel guilty. There's clarity in crying. It's good. A lot of rooms in the library you can also assign, you can rent out like for free. You can just sign out and then you can lock and close the door. That might be their crying corner. 
A crying corner is especially important if your teenager is living in a shared apartment or a residence with a shared room and their roommate's pillow is right there and your teenager just needs a good cry. Maybe they're struggling, maybe they miss home. Having also going into the bathroom, locking the door and turning the tap on, that's another great way to have a crying corner. These are actually really important ways to support your teenager, to let them know it's okay to miss home, it's okay to feel overwhelmed, it's okay to ask for help. It is okay if um, they're not happy and they decide this isn't for them. That's okay too. They've gotta let the feelings out first because pretending will serve nobody. Pretending does nothing, except actually makes things a lot worse. So find their crying corner, specifically if they're in a shared living environment or roommate where, um, and know that it's okay to miss home. It's okay to have feelings um, and make agreements with their roommate about what that looks like. Um, also, if they have a roommate that they haven't met before, so this is a university assigned roommate, or um, a shared accommodation with someone they haven't met before, please don't have the expectation that their roommate is your bestie. That will tank that relationship so fast, it'll make the Titanic look slow, okay? Your roommate is your roommate. They don't have to be your bestie. Putting the expectation of that, that you're gonna be besties on top of the roommate uh, relationship is, it's awful, don't do it. Do not do it, okay? Um, because it's too much. Come up with the agreement, set boundaries about what works for you and what doesn't. What does the kitchen cleaning look like? What does borrowing each other's stuff look like? Um, like kitchen utensils and things like that, if that's the situation. So that your teenager feels equipped to have a good relationship with their roommate, because that's more important than expecting you're gonna be besties. So please don't do that too. And you also don't need to like their friends and they don't need to like your friends and you can still be great roommates. Okay, so careful of expectations here, especially moving away from home where the need for social connection is so important about the expectations you put on a roommate. Um, do not pack all of your bleep. Don't pack all of your bleep. Uh, if you don't use it on a daily basis, this is not from me, this is from teenagers I asked. If you don't use it on a daily basis, don't take it. You don't need it. Okay, your, your living space is extremely small. Um, you, your teenager may be moving to a place where they have a meal plan, so they don't need a lot of cooking stuff. Um, they might just get a fridge for a few of their extras. If this is, if they don't use it on a daily basis, don't take all the knickknacks and stuff. There isn't room and it's going to be more frustrating. They're going to have too much stuff, more clutter. Clutter externally can clutter the brain. So just, no, take the basics. It's okay. Um, also, if you wanna bring it, bring some childhood things. This was interesting that a teenager said to this to me, look, don't be embarrassed about bringing a childhood thing. Like if you wanna bring some stuffies and you wanna, and boys get a really hard rap on this. It's not fair, it's not true. If your son has a stuffy or a blanket or a something they still really, just, it just feels safe. It's something familiar from home and they want to shove it at the far end of their bed or shove it in their pillowcase, then do so. Then do that. Okay? But bringing important and emotional attachment things from home is okay to a small degree. Okay? Not everything. But if they need to bring something to feel safe and better about being away, then let them do it. Please don't put the expectation on them that, you know, oh, you're too old for that. You don't need that. That's for baby. Like, don't do that. Don't do it. Okay? Um, any advice for someone who spent a childhood full of trauma? I'm taking, but hadn't started therapy. Oh, honey. Yeah. Well, I've done childhood trauma. I got myself into counseling. That was actually one of the coolest things when I went away to university is there was free counseling. I walked myself in those doors three weeks in when I was like, this is my, I am not Okay. Um, so get yourself into therapy or counseling. It's often free through student services. Know where the student services building is. Know where the student medical services building is. Those people are there to help students and know where it is. Get to know who the counselors are, who the therapists are, um, the doctors, the, there's nurses on staff. Get to know who those people are because um, they're there for you. Okay, I have one last thing. Meal planning. 
if your student is going away somewhere where there is not a meal plan, they're living off campus, etc., they're going to need to know how to cook basic meals in a healthy way that supports their brain, their sleep, their mental health. If they don't already know this, you're going to want to start now. Also, I have was told that it is a great idea to do some cooking soon after moving in, like based on your first grocery shop, and get meals put in the freezer. Whatever it is, put it in the freezer. So make sure they have containers or something that they can put food in the freezer because when it hits exam time and or some of those 50% assignments are due in the year, they're not gonna make time to cook something and they might not have the money to order in. That can get really expensive. So having food in the freezer, pre-made food that they made at the very beginning of the semester when they had a bit more time uh, or on the first weekend, just cook two meals, but do like a really big, um, um, like a big batch of it and, and then put like, put three or four or five of them in the freezer. It will really help when things get tough. And here's my last piece. Talk to your teenager, but don't expect your teenager to text you about everything or to call you every night or to call you every weekend. They are now really living in their own world, their own life. So careful of your expectations of how much your teenager is gonna wanna connect with you if you text your teenager, let them send encouraging texts. I believe in you. I hope you're having an amazing time. I know things can feel hard. It's okay. Lots of encouraging, not I miss you and you haven't called in a week. No, don't do the guilt trip text, please, about how often they've called you. Don't do that. I'm paying for this. You should be letting me know how it's going. Please don't do that. Do not put that on your teenager, okay? If you talk to your teenager, do not make the conversation only about how their courses are going, what grades they have, how they're doing on their assignments, and what's due tomorrow. Please do not do that. If you talk to your teenager, please ask them, how are they doing? How are they feeling? How can you support them in any, do they, would they like any support? Or what are they struggling with? And that it's okay to struggle and that you believe in them you're going to help they're going to find their way because you even if you did this in high school are not there for them now and you cannot fix rescue um you can't make it better all you can do is let them know you believe in them that they're going to find their way that that if they're if they want your support that you can help them do maybe you know some people are really good at those really visual um color coded maps and some people aren't. It's a skill. It's not about being responsible or not. That's just that some people are super like um, visual and like, you know, crafty, the colored pens and all that. Maybe that's something you help your teenager wish that they with that they find super helpful because that's not their thing. But once you help them build it, they take it and run with it. Maybe they're good at the big chart, but not as good at prioritization. Maybe that's something you can help them with. But please consider this help not doing it for them, okay? You can't rescue them. This is their experience. This is them becoming whoever it is that they are meant here to be. Um, yes, this is gonna be saved to my, my profile. Don't worry, this is gonna be here. It'll save permanently, okay? Um, so Safina, maybe you just take less courses, hun. It's not worth having a heavy workload if it's not something you think you can participate in fully. Okay, I wanna just say one last thing to wrap up. This is something my husband tells my kids and I totally agree with it. I went away to university to a different city, from a very small city to a really big city. When you go to college or university, nobody knows you. Maybe a few people will know you, but you can be anyone you wanna be. If you didn't like who you were in high school, then don't be that you like you arrive on campus. People don't know you from Adam. They don't know who you were. They don't know where you came from. I'm not saying lie. I'm not saying pretend to be something you're not. I'm saying walk in those university doors or college campus doors and be the person that you want to be. And that's who those people will believe you are because they don't know who you were. So you get to be, you get to like make up who you are 
from an authentic place, okay? If maybe you were playing small in high school or maybe you were playing too big, maybe you didn't think that you listened enough, maybe you wanted to talk more, I don't know, but go be that person. Go give yourself permission to be that person, okay? And I know I just posted, a, I've done videos about quitting and things like that. I, parents, look, if your teenager gets away to university or school and after a first semester, they find that that is not for them, or maybe they're just not ready, that's okay. That's okay. Let them come home. They can work. Okay, they can work for a year. Maybe they need to work for two years. They're just not ready. That doesn't make them immature or irresponsible. That makes them very prudent with your college fund. Okay, so let's be careful of expectations of them being a doctor or a lawyer, or maybe they go a semester into what they were really passionate about and go, no, this isn't at all what I thought. And they wanna change majors. Okay, let them change majors. Learning is never lost. You can't unlearn anything. Once you know it, you know it. It's in your brain. Okay? So um, set boundaries, yes, around what finances might look like and be realistic with your teenager. But if they want to change or they want to come home, it's not for them, then just roll with it, but love them unconditionally. This is going from high school to college or university is a massive step into being an adult. And it can be really scary, even if you have are the most supportive and encouraging family that you can. So um, love them, be encouraging, be supportive, check your stories, check your expectations. All right, I wanna thank you so much for joining me today. Please share this with anyone who you feel might need it. I know I will be in this boat in the fall. Thank you so much, everyone. I'll see you next week on my IGTV. In the meantime, you can always catch me on TikTok at Allie Payne or message me here if you have any other questions. I'll see what resources I can find you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.